to help individuals manage their money so that they can manage their lives. And so that's a, a tagline of ours and helping them build financial freedom. Uh, and that's how my business started. So it, from seeing a need, but then realizing uh, from the standpoint of being a nonprofit, still a business first, but just classified as a nonprofit, that there was a tremendous need for individuals to have just very basic information so that we can make better financial choices and money management decisions. And it has grown um, to be what it is today to include, we had already uh, started doing small business training because of course individuals having budgeting problems. If you take that talent that you have, you can create income. And so we began to do small business training uh, about seven years ago actually to support the community in that way. So that's really how I got started. Again, once again, like Ms. Monique, self-funded. Uh, I jokingly tell folks we started with the Bank of Bernique. So, <laughs> um, you, we, and, and that, isn't that how all entrepreneurs start though, right? right. So um, definitely started that way and, and, and have grown, of course, as a nonprofit organization to have the support of several local banks and, and grant funding and all of that right now. So. And you're yeah. opening uh, when? The Women's Business Center is yeah. currently open. We are now taking applications and okay. using this month as our launch month or celebration month uh, okay. uh, and everything. So yes. The, the building that's on uh, Rivers, right? Ah, okay. So, so the opening yeah. of the Women's Business Center and the building are two different things. Okay, got <laughs> The it. Women's Business Center, which we are the host of, we are open for services as of mm -hmm. right now. The building, the Opportunity Center, which is our 30,000 square foot building that Increasing Hope will be housed in, and now also the Women's Business Center, right in the middle of renovations. I was there at the building today showing a funder. Hmm. Um, it will be open around September, October of this year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that's right down the block from where I live, so I might be able to <laughs> yeah. come by and help out when I can. Definitely. Love to have you. Yeah. Paint a wall or two, not the Hampton. That should all be done. Hopefully, we'll move in there. You can get him in to do some coaching and counseling with the women's business. Well, that would be good. <laughs> yeah. And I'll just share. So, um, I guess our, our concept for our business started. Um, I was an adjunct professor at the University of the District of Columbia for several years in their funeral service, uh, a mortuary science program, and um, decided to resign from that position because I got married. <laughs> and my uh, now husband said, wait a minute, we got a whole lot of balls in the air, something's gotta go. So that was an easy choice. But um, the students sort of followed me into opportunities to tutor. And from that, um, it just sort of grew into what is now a virtual uh, co coaching program towards success on the exams. Um, just, um, it, it's been very, very small start for us. Um, we don't have like major advertisements or anything like that. It's just a few social media platforms, but I, I am a testimony of doing it well and, and your words, you know, just kind of growing your business because it's very much as the funeral industry is, it's very much word of mouth. So many of our clients come by others being successful and telling them through their mortuary science programs. Um, in terms of the funding, it's been self-funded for certain. And my husband is a good kind of guardrail for me because I would probably throw all my salary at it to, um, to make sure that it's successful. But, you know, we budgeted what could go from our income into that growth. And, um, and so that's sort of how we've done what we've done for the past uh, two years. Um, all right. Well, the next question that I have for everyone is what were the um, what were your biggest challenges in regards to funding for your businesses? Shall I start again? Um, so as I said before, my business was kind of one of those things that um, I was in doing business before I was in business. So I, I think one of the greatest challenges was having to go back and um, put all of the foundation that I didn't start off with uh, in place, um, which 
I mean, things as basic as a business licensing, um, filing, you know, for the organization uh, with the state, things like that. I had done it, like I said, I didn't really consider it a business when I first started. It just kind of morphed into that. And so the challenges having to go back and do that is you've lost, in my case, I had lost um, at least a year or two um, of doing that, that I could have had in uh, financials and just proof of concept that I could have um, been able to be set up to, to be viable for uh, other funding sources. But because I hadn't do that, I kind of got put behind. Um, I think that my situation is not unique to me uh -huh. because I feel like a lot of business women start off that way or, or businesses in general is that you kind of start doing what you love or what you need. And then you realize that you got your hands onto something great. And then you have to figure out how to go back and do it. <clears throat> and then I think the other piece is going to be, I am so happy that Increasing Hope has a center here because I have been uh, working with the center up in Columbia because that was the one that um, was closest to us. So now that we have the solid resource in our community, um, I think we'll see a lot of women really being able to grow their businesses and understand the financial foundation that really positions us to be able to grow and scale. Well, I think for me personally, again, I'm the outlier here in being a nonprofit organization. So funding for us is a little bit different in that um, we do have the opportunity to write grants, to seek foundation, to seek funding. Um, uh, also specifically because of the type of service I offer, I'm able to partner with banks because they see the value in what we do in reference to helping individuals with their finances. So uh, not unlike any other entrepreneur, you're starting off, you have your own cash in there. We were able to grow. Uh, my business acumen side had me kind of sort you know set everything up initially so that we could pursue grants and get the funding and everything um, that we needed. I think our biggest obstacle or whatever when it comes to funding is, um, and it's not normally an uh, obstacle, it's the world of the nonprofit, which is, and I tell young ladies or people who want to start a nonprofit organization, it is the hardest thing you will ever do. They are the most regulated entities right below a bank. And so if there's anything that is a challenge, it is being able to meet all the requirements, uh, jump through all the hoops. Uh, that is sometimes required for you to get that funding. You can be doing everything right, everything per perfect, but it is a lot of things that you're doing. And it takes time in this industry. Also, you're building relationships. And so after 15 years, I can now pick up the phone and call one of my banks and say, we're doing this event or we're doing this and ask for 10 or $15,000. But to start off, you, I mean, you have to build into that. You have to grow into that. And so I think that will be one of our biggest challenges or would have been a challenge in, re in respect to, number one, for funding sake, they want to see outcomes and things. But if you're a young organization, you don't have any yet, just like a small business um, and, uh, and, and those numbers and things. And so that, that, it's like, you're doing great. We love what you're doing, but we can't give you any money right now. And it's like, you know, so, um, so those were some of the things or a bank saying, great, we love this program. It's awesome. It's tremendous, but you don't have enough money in the bank right now. So we can't fund you. And it's like, well, if I had enough money in the bank, I wouldn't need your money. Okay. <laughs> you know, so uh, again, that nonprofit world, just that thinking the, the behind philanthropy of also, we want you to work miracles with this little bit of money that we give you. Uh, uh, with outcomes. And so that's kind of my world. Um, but I love what I do. And again, over the years now, relationships have been built whereby um, it's not as hard and doors are opening, um, but it took some time for that to happen. I think the only thing that um, I would add, three things immediately came to mind. Um, I think, again, we're self-funded. So as, as we've grown, realizing uh, when it's appropriate and needful for you to add members of your team and to your team and just sort of kind of outsourcing that and being okay with that because it, it's a cost. And, and so just realizing that and having to uh, work that sort of nuance out into your business plan. The second thing, we do have a physical product. 
And so again, kind of going to my husband and saying, okay, the, you know, the, the upfront is $10,000, honey. I'm going to get it back. I am going to get it back. This product is going to work. But the realities of that, because when you, you know, physical products, that whole kind of, that is very challenging when you're adding that into your business. And so, um, and so that immediately came to mind. And then the reality of your time does cost. I think sometimes um, when you're a small business owner or entrepreneur, because you're just doing it and you know um, the end result of that business and what it's gonna bring to your client, you don't really cost out your own time, but you have to, you have to be able to say, um, this actually costs this, you know, X dollars because it costs your time that day or over that week or month. And so I would say that uh, in response to funding and cost. Yeah, in economics, we'd call that opportunity cost, right? The Any time you're spending working on your business or anything is money you're not, or time you're not spending making money. So, that's the easiest way to think about it is how much would you be making if you were working as opposed to working on your business? Or how much would you be paid, you know, for the work that you're doing? Um, I have a question. Um, how is running a business different than what you thought it would be when you first started? That's a good question because I think, you know, again, um, I currently work full time. So this is juggling um, like m many others who fund their business through their um, general uh, income. And so I guess one of the main things that uh, I probably didn't know what I didn't know, first of all, let me start there. Um, so I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know, you know, a lot. I didn't really have a good grasp on what I needed also, because again, I was creating something um, that I thought I just needed and it just kind of morphed into it. And so it was a lot of trial and error. Um, it was a lot of partnering, and so it was a lot of bartering, so not a lot of exchange of money. It was skills being exchanged and also just support, in-kind um, support, um, is where my sponsorships have, for the most part, come from. And so um, I guess if I had to pinpoint something, it may, I would probably have to say, um, the, the time commitment, um, you know, those things that you sometimes get bogged down, not, I, want, I don't wanna say bogged down as in it's a negative because I agree with Dr. Hansen, it's an opportunity and, you know, although it's not income producing, there is value in other things that you do, but when you're managing um, multiple things, time is, super precious and so I underestimate often uh, the 24 hours that I have and what I can do um, in those 24 hours and I think was that Anita who mentioned also the needing the support so recognizing that although you're small and you're self-funded and you really don't have the resources to grow a team um, immediately that help is needed and there are some things that can may cost a little more, but it's gonna save you on the other end, such as administrative help, uh, graphic artists, attorney, you know, those essential things that you should invest in. And so had I known that, I probably would have um, set things up differently. And I would have also probably gotten a little more sleep <laughs> without trying to do all the things by myself. So um, I think those would be my, my two things. And I still struggle with the team thing. So um, that's a work in progress. So I'll just add two things. Um, for me, um, being okay, well, I think one of the two greatest learning 
um, outcomes has been being okay with being specialized. Um, I mean, I've done a lot of things career-wise and you know, in this sort of very, very specialized coaching of funeral directors and embalmers, like people like, what, who, who does that? I didn't even know, I don't even know an embalmer. I don't, I don't want to talk to you. I don't want to touch you, whatever, but being okay with just being that and, you know, hearing others come my way and saying, well, what about, no, no, I'm going to stay in my lane. This is, this is what I'm doing now. And I'm going to perfect this if that's fear. So the second thing that I would say is it's been very humbling because I'm probably professionally, I've never had people really tell me no. I mean, I'm an 06 captain in the military. So a lot of people say, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am, all day. Well, when you're small business owners, people say, no, no, thank you. And that's been very humbling because they have a choice of you or nothing or maybe another vendor. And so that has been, that's been a blessing. It really has. It wasn't that wasn't my initial thought when I started getting those, but now it's, <laughs> I look at it now as a blessing. I think for me, um, like so many other, it's not, a, it's not a thought process that I had when I started my business, but it's one that I have uh, learned from and I think will allow me to be an example to others. And that is just realizing the amount of time that it may take for your business to be successful or for your business to be noticed by others or, or whatever the case may be, what, you know, you put any word or name on it. It's just that it does not come overnight mm -hmm. and that um, it is hard work, whether it be a for-profit or a nonprofit, but realizing that um, you are your greatest asset for your business, uh, realizing that, that uh, you are the face and there are some things that can be uh, contracted out or given out, but then there are some that cannot. And being able to recognize the difference between those as you are growing your business. And, uh, and then finally, I will say, um, protecting your business. Protecting it, not just from the standpoint of trademarking or this, that, and the other, but protecting it from the standpoint of being a business of integrity, doing business the right way, uh, honoring and, and uh, being trustworthy. Those are some of the type things that, that you learn or you, and some of it comes from just who you are as an individual, your, your value system that going into who you are and, and being a part of your business. But those are things that for me now, I believe will be able to be lessons for people that are coming through the Women's Business Center, uh, what that journey is like and the things that you have to be willing literally to quote unquote, for lack of a better words, endure as you are growing your business. Because there will be things that you literally endure or go through because you believe that much in what you're doing. Um, and others may never ever see that part or know that part, but, but you always do as that business owner. I'm so glad you said that because that was a lesson that I had to learn too after the fact, because um, in the beginning, um, as I was growing and um, getting more and more creative and expanding, there was a lot of people telling me what I needed to do, which lane I needed to stay in. And it wasn't until I really focused in on the market that I, I wanted to serve and I needed to serve that everything started to really just fall into place but it took mm -hmm. me having to tell people you know no that's not the direction I'm going or mm -hmm. just blocking out all of the unsolicited <laughs> advice that uh, <laughs> we tend definitely. to get mm -hmm. and um, so so yeah that's definitely a lesson and I think it is a although sometimes it's a hard lesson it's one that um if you can learn it early enough, it'll just, it'll make all the difference in changing the, the scope and the direction of your business. So mm -hmm. I'm glad you said that. So now I can join the rank, ranks of others who had to have so many hard lessons, but that's a good one. Yeah, I, I, I would just add that um, a lot of what you're saying are common stories. Um, the kind of the norm uh, and stuff that we cover in our classes. Um, you, I, as you're mentioning things, I keep thinking of little phrases that have come up either, uh, hi, um, like 
uh, the focusing, um, the saying is there are riches in niches, right? Focus in on and own your little niche, right? Be the best in that. Um, the not pursuing everything that everybody, you know, that just makes you busy. And so I had a speaker that used to come in and say, don't confuse being busy with being profitable. Mm -hmm. All right. Don't uh, confuse busy with being productive. Yeah. That too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's, um, uh, find it basically a lot is very common for a, a startup that it, you're doing something that you need and it turns out other people need it too. Mm -hmm. And that's what turns into your business. Mm -hmm. um, so it all starts with, with a need. Uh, so that's, that's really common. Starting with an idea is usually going to fail unless you're willing to adjust that idea. But focusing on the customer on, and, and what they need, that's, that's, and if that's a need that you already have and you're already filling it, that's pretty much how it goes. Can I, I also add, add? Oh, I'm sorry. No, Anise just rejoined. I got out of my car and I got home. So um, I have, I do apologize for missing some of your comments, but um, I do think that you're talking about the motivations of establishing your business or what you should have as your lead reason for um, selecting the business you uh, decide or I did decide to establish. And um, I just want to say that um, I think it's very different for everybody. Um, I come from a family of business owners. And um, when you have a family of business owners, oftentimes the, the family business is, you know, you're led to be a part of it and are you are encouraged to be a business person. Um, personally, um, I'm at the stage where I've been a part of establishing uh, a variety of businesses. I don't want to go through it and, and take up your time, but in the business that I'm looking at now, it's very different than the type of business that I would have looked at, you know, at the stage that you all are at. Um, because I wasn't in a city professionally that is so tourism oriented as Charleston is. So um, also con attributing that to being at a point, I wanna do what makes me really passionate. You know, I don't care what it is. Um, and so as opposed to earlier and at other phases of my professional life, I did, you know, of course, look at a niche or, or what the customer needed and, you know, what was out there. Um, you know, for example, one of the ladies mentioned that she had a, a, a type of um, empowerment, women's and young women's empowerment type business. I formed an empowerment and etiquette program um, while I was in, while I was substitute teaching for high schoolers because I saw the niche and the need. Would I, I did all the right things as far as marketing it and, you know, establishing, um, I didn't go through the business licensing, that kind of thing, but I know all of the things I'm supposed to do because I have a, a business degree and a banking and finance background. But when you're, you know, when you're at a point of, you know, seeing a niche or feeling passionate about something, you kind of just go with the, you know, head on. And that's what I did. And what I found was that the young ladies in schools were willing to pay, and I only charged $10 for my program. Um, they preferred to put it in their hair or their nails, as opposed to coming, you know, on Sundays to an etiquette program and paying $10, you know, for, you know, the, the nicely prepared lunch and the professionals that I brought in for them to, you know, seek individual knowledge and information from, and, you know, the, the, the whole program. And what I should have done in hindsight was gone for a grant 
um, and uh, just, you know, timing and prioritizing was where I fell short, I feel. So. I'm done. Thank you. Um, so that brings me to the next question. Um, we just talked really a lot about like advice. So what popular entrepreneurial um, advice do you disagree with? I'll go on that one. And we just barely touched on it a little bit here uh, as we were chatting, which is that multiple streams of income. You hear that all the time. You need multiple streams. If this doesn't work, this doesn't work. That is the worst idea or advice anyone could give you or that you could take. Why? Because if you are growing your business, you need to be able to focus. You need to be able to put all of your time, all of your energy, all of your efforts into one thing and not uh, dispense or die, what is it? dilute the energy. I, I describe it like a laser. A laser is a powerful, powerful thing, can burn through something. But if that light is diffused, it won't go through or penetrate anything. And when we have two and three and four businesses, that's exactly what we're doing. We are, our efforts are diluted. We don't get the, the, the results that we want. And so for me, that is a huge one. That multiple streams of income, you need multiple streams of income. I've been doing Increasing Hope for 15 years. This is my own first business, my only business, and hopefully it will be my only business. And all of my effort and all of my time and all of my energy has gone into this one business. And I believe that that is a part of the reason why we are seeing the level of success now. So that's my soapbox. Guys, don't listen to that multiple streams of income thing maybe once you get your business up and yes, so Increasing Hope does do housing counseling and can we get grants from that? Yes, that's a stream of income. And we do um, charge small fees to our clients. That's a stream of income. But I don't have three different businesses producing three separate streams of income off of three separate products. That's not the idea concept of that. So that's, I'll stop, I'll stop. <laughs> I, I'd add two, two things to that. One is that, that, that goes the same for like who you're focusing on as a market, mm -hmm. right? So there's the tendency, let's go for everybody that we can. Let's think all the people that we could sell to as opposed to focusing on, on the people who have the greatest need. Uh, but I would add that rather than multiple streams, um, what you want are the multiple levels of the same thing, the, mm -hmm. the good, better, best strategy. So the people who are willing and can pay more, mm -hmm you offer them something more, you know, give them the upgrade. That's, that's where the multiple stream should be, just simply higher quality, more features, whatever it might be. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, a good one. And that's definitely one of my strategies with the good, better, best, because you find quickly that people there within your, your target also, there is um, different levels and people will pay just what um, you for the value that they need um, and they expect and so that was one of the things that I've um, recently um, added into my business because before it was although I I, I keep mine streamlined also um, I think let me go back so <clears throat> one of the best pieces of advice I got versus one of the worst is that you need to identify, this is what a mentor told me, just think about the thing that, that moves you, think about all of your gifts, the things that you don't mind doing if you were not to get paid for. And so that is why doing this made it a little more, not even a little more, a lot more easier for me, because I consider myself to be a connector. And so when I thought about my career, my training, my all of that, that was like the common thread through it all. And so I've just figured out a way to monetize it. And that's having a gift of not only bringing people together, but also just making people feel good, which lends itself to 
better partnerships, better relationships, genuine partnerships, that is, because we don't want to just pretend like we're making people feel good just to get their money. I'm not saying that. These are genuine um, connections. But, you know, once I figured that out and figured out how to get creative within that to um, really add in some additional streams um, in different levels, um, it's changed the game. And I, I, I'll say that this honestly, because I'm always transparent. So transparency also gets you a long way because you not only um, allow other people to hear what your, your challenges and struggles are, but it's relatable and people want to relate. You know, we're, we're humans, we want that connection. And, you know, and being transparent is saying that, you know, this is a new strategy that I incorporated within the last two years. I launched my business officially in 2015. And so we're talking, I mean, years later after I really got a, a, a rhythm and learning and continuing to learn, um, I think um, someone mentioned earlier that you know, coming from a family of entrepreneurs, well, where I'm from, we didn't, we didn't see business owners, we didn't see black owned businesses, didn't have them in my family. And when I think about it, we did have entrepreneurs that we saw, but we did not connect that to, to being a business. So an example is we had a older gentleman in our neighborhood who, who sold sodas. You could go to his house, you could get a soda, you could get chips. Part of it was him just, you know, living alone and wanting people to, to be around. The other part was he had an entire <laughs> convenience store out of his home, but we didn't look at things like that as businesses. And so um, when I was growing up, it was, you know, you go to college and you get a job. And so I've had to learn a lot about uh, business, fail a lot, lose a lot of money. Uh, not make money, work hard uh, for nothing. But um, in the end, you know, I think it's you're always learning, you're always growing. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things that that overnight success is overrated. So people who think that people wake up and have a bright idea and they're in business and they're millionaires within a week, that's probably my biggest <laughs> uh, myth. So I'll, um, I'll stop there, but yeah, there is, it, it's, it's, a, it's truly a journey that I didn't realize what the journey um, would be and where it would lead me to and just not having a real perspective of what this type of monetization of my passion and skills um, would be and that it would even make me money. So, um, so yeah, just ever evolving. So I love that, Monique. I, I almost said, were we neighbors? I mean, I grew up in <laughs> Sumter, but we everybody had that gentleman or that little lady where you could run down there and get a chicken sandwich or a bag of chips or something in a crunch. But um, so I think I'm, I'm going to uh, share a twist to it. So, so the best advice was um, includes know your value. So just because you're new and you're small does not mean you need to price your services or your products inexpensively they're what they are. I mean, you're going to grow and you know the value that you're going to add and you know the change that that implementation will bring to the customer. So that that was some really, really good advice. The other um, advice was, um, you know, validation is, is for parking tickets. Like I don't need to be validated. I know who I am. I stand in that value and you need to convey that in everything that you do and say when you interact with your potential customers. The worst advice was to be everywhere. Like, you know, there's Clubhouse, there's LinkedIn, there's Twitter, there's Facebook, there's Instagram. I'm like, I can't keep up with all those, you know, logins and I don't even understand them all. I told somebody I've never tweeted. I've never been, I don't even, I don't know what, I know it's a bird and that's the extent of it. So what I've come to realize is I'm not trying to find, because people will say, find where your customers are, know when they post. And I, that's too that's too complicated for me. What I'm going to do is choose the platforms that I understand, that I like, and I'm just going to post and be present there and good give good information, add value uh, to 
in my post, not posting just to post, add value and be confident with that because I cannot be on all those platforms. That, that was just craziness for me. And just the idea made me anxious. So that's my shoe. If I can come back in, um, the ladies that spoke, they, get, they have given you excellent. And when I say excellent, I say excellent with an emphasis on the E, advice. However, I'm somewhat of a rebel when it comes to how things are supposed to be. <laughs> and so what I want to share with you is you may have some rebels in your environment that don't do it the right way, because I have been involved in the arts um, community. And for example, I, I could see where you have a business where you primarily um, uh, showcase you know, Af African art, but why not showcase African jewelry? Why not showcase African music, you know, our African-American music? It's still an arts component. There are different types of arts, but if a person comes in looking for a, you know, meaningful piece of visual art, if they see a piece of jewelry, then that can supplement your income. You see what I'm saying? So I look at it a little bit more broad based and because I'm at the stage that I am in my life um, I'm not um, I'm going to attribute it to the beautiful ladies here I'm not successful business wise but I'm just sharing with you how I thought I have been thinking about different income streams especially understanding the dynamics of what happened to our economy in 2008. My mother passed in 2004 and left me money so I was the assistant cultural arts director of North Charleston had a lot of passion a lot of know-how and so I said I would establish my own cultural arts event planning company, Miss Monique Hill, okay? <laughs> and, but who knew that the economy, when I, when I first, I got thousand dollar gigs. I planned the first African arts festival on um, Marion Square Park, you know, with grant funding and all that kind of thing. So I was establishing my personal business, but who knew that the economy was going to go, you know, just crazy, where it was a lost economy on every level, you know, in 2008, 7, 2008. So that affected, you know, everything that I did. So now as I, and also just recently with COVID, you know, look at the people who have all kinds of businesses focused in one entity, but maybe different income streams, which Ms. Dorothea, please forgive me, was how I'm thinking now, um, you know, with my passion being tourism, I'm thinking Charleston gift baskets to put online because not everybody can come to Charleston anymore. And those who come want something to take back with them. I'm thinking about maybe getting something a little bit more part-time solidified so I can have um, benefits perhaps, or at least an income stream of dependable sources coming in. So maybe with a college or university, because mm -hmm. uh, they didn't close down <laughs> completely. And then I'm thinking of, uh, as I said, something with the International African American Museum, a program that's maybe directed to preteens and teens that I can offer them that maybe they don't have. So you see what I'm saying? Different and still within uh, maybe tiers with the gift basket, that kind of thing. You know, you can get a $25 one, a $50 one, or a $200 one. You know, that's what I'm saying. So that is how I'm looking. I'm not saying I'm right, but I just wanted to let you know, you do have a rebel among you. 
Actually, I, I think what you described is right on um, in terms of what everybody else was sharing about staying focused because you're uh -huh. all I heard was art and you know you're staying true to that you're just monetizing it in different ways so whether uh -huh. you are looking at gift uh, baskets or events that are based in that same art. Um, I, I feel like that's a, along the same lines, but we got a financial advisor on here. So what do you think? Oh, I know, well, <laughs> girl, <laughs> I tell, I'm a former assistant national bank examiner and auditor. So I know all the finances, rather I lived it. I'm just saying in the past, because it's a new day. Yes. So I'm very open and, you know, I need all the help, you know, so, you know, I'm, I'm very open for good advice now because I, I don't listen to myself. <laughs> My own well, we'll go to lunch. We'll, okay. we'll, we'll all Thank go to lunch you. and we'll have Thank a you. conversation. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I just wanted to open the floor now. If you guys have any questions for us or each other, um, feel free to absolutely ask and we can all have an open discussion about that. I don't know if you do, but no pressure. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll ask a question to everybody uh, is what could the college do to help you more? You're asking us? Yeah. Oh, let me just tell you, um, I'm a Howard grad. This is new, my interaction with you all, but especially with Kamala, you know, being one of our representatives, I was going to approach Howard about having a major university summit at like the biggest ball field or something that they could have. Too, because there's so many successful people, but, you know, and they say we will connect, you know, we will network, but to be able to have something like that where students can come back and interact with those who've been successful, not so successful, people like me that still have to work at 68 years old, you know, um, that there could be that kind of networking, you know, you obviously would go back and see, you know, your people you went to school with if they decide to come, but those, you know, um, business entities that set up, then you would have, you know, the top resources to go to and say, you know, this is where I am at this stage in my life and I need X, Y, and Z to happen you know, your business does this. I'm meeting you face to face. You're a Howard graduate the way that, you know, I'm a Howard graduate, but I still need your help and connection. And then, you know, you fill out the form for them to get back to you or something like that. I, you know, that's the vision I have. And from your standpoint, you know, it's almost like what you're doing now. It's like putting people together who can, who have, everybody has something to bring to the table. So you may, um, uh, the lady there may have um, the expertise in financing and how to establish new businesses and that kind of thing, but maybe she needs something from one of us. So to have that kind of interaction on, you know, Ms. Dorothea, how, what is it about me that other than me coming to you for business, what is it about me and my resources that I can do to help bring you some benefit to your life? You know, something like that. I love that. I actually agree. And I've, thought about this question a lot because we've had many conversations Dr. Hansen but this this is what I would like to see from the College of Charleston uh, for a couple of reasons so number one because you're right downtown um, blocks away from what's going to be the new African-American international African-American um, museum and we all know that there is a lack of Black-owned businesses 
in the vicinity. So we're talking about an international museum that is going to be opening its doors the end of this year, if not 2022, and attracting people from all over the world and for history rooted in the same businesses that aren't, won't be able to, to benefit from this traffic that the museum will bring in, um, let alone the general tourist um, traffic that we get right from the cruise ships and just in general with people coming into town. And so I, I would think it may be worth exploring or at least having more conversations about how the College of Charleston can support um, what's currently the lack of diversity there, but support some sort of initiative and by support, um, I use that very loosely and I wanna keep it general because I think the support can be um, the advocacy piece. So bringing together not only a huge piece of the puzzle, which are the people, women of color, businesses of color in general, minority and women bringing us together, but but connecting the dots, right? From the business owners to the COGs who have a responsibility to make sure that our economic development is inclusive of businesses that are often um, overlooked. So I don't know specifically what the role of College of Charleston would be, but I do know the College of Charleston has a very loud voice that could not only influence and get people in the room that need to be having this conversation that could figure out how to do this, but um, also you have this amazing um, school of business that's hosting these types of events and um, that many people like myself can, can benefit from not only the experience, but also the partnerships. And so what is a bigger role for the College of Charleston? So is it a bigger um, event? Is it a conference? Is it whatever? But the voice that you all have, I just feel like you can influence so many um, things. And my last piece of that, so number one is the lack of Black businesses within walking distance of the museum. Number two, using um, the voice. And then the third thing I would think would be, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the third thing would be in terms of um, I want to be specific the how I say this. So I'm trying to make sure my thoughts come out um, right. But I would think that, I don't know, just simply, you know, providing the voice, the, the data, you have some amazing faculty there who are doing the research, have done the research and can get access and extrapolate the numbers for this downtown area to be able to then support um, the Charleston city government. Um, and like I said, I'm not really sure of the specific role, but I do know I've been as a, you know, just a invested uh, business owner, but also as an invest invested um, resident, been talking to these different groups about these same issues. And it never quite, the conversation never quite comes together with the right people. So um, perhaps College of Charleston taking a lead on that. I think that's a really good idea. I'm gonna just jump in here. Um, I think I was taking some notes while you guys were talking. And I think this is all information that um, the three or the four of us could really work on, um, you know, working with the school. I mean, we're such young adults and we have a pretty loud voice with pretty loud, big yeah, platform. Make some noise. And I think, yeah, I think this is something that um, all four of us are really passionate about. Um, you know, we wouldn't be here if we didn't care. Um, this is something that, That's you know, beautiful. we all enjoy. Yeah, we all enjoy being here and, and working with you guys. And, you know, we get to network with y'all, which is really great. Um, 
but I think this is definitely something that, you know, we can all work together um, and, you know, feel free to, you know, absolutely email us. I can put all of our emails down in the chat too. So, you know, if there was ever something that you needed help with or, you know, something that we could do as students, you know, I would love to hear from you guys. I think that'd be really fun. Well, when you say you have, you know, a voice, that's, that is absolutely true. When, when students, if enough students get together and say they want something, <laughs> the administration will listen. So if you all want to demand this or that, it's more likely to happen. Um, so if, uh, for example, you wanted to have a, like, I would imagine like a center devoted to supporting uh, women and minority owned businesses, something like that. Um, I mean, that's something I've thought about. Uh, we have a center for entrepreneurship, um, but that's very broadly focused. Um, we can change that, but you know, that's, that's something to discuss. Um, more immediately, um, in just over a month, I'm starting to teach an online class on uh, women and minority owned businesses. So part of what uh, I'm gonna take from this is like what that class is going to be because I haven't fully, I, you know, I have some ideas on what the class is gonna be, um, but I'm, I tend to uh, just be opportunistic when it comes to my classes. So it also means that it's, the plans are, are sometimes coming together as the class is already underway. <laughs> but um, I, I like to be able to, to use my classes to do something related to helping a community. Um, so part of the reason why I asked that question then was in, in being somewhat selfish here and in, in thinking about what I could do with this, with this class coming up um, this next month. Can I chime in just a little there? I, I think I'm going to say what Monique was trying to say. I'm just going to say it, is that um, collaboration is key. That hangs on the wall in my office. When I started my organization, when no one would support, when no one believed in what we were doing, I purposed that I would be an example of collaboration. Part of the reason why I'm getting ready to be able to move into a 30,000 square foot building and expand the services of our organization the way we have is because I was willing to come to the table with other organizations that were different from me, that maybe thought from me, but we had enough in common to have a desire to serve this community that we chose to collaborate. And so people ask me, how did it happen? I say, we did something that most people only talk about. I said, we chose to collaborate. So Dr. Hansen, a collaboration. And again, the Women's Business Center has a focus of minority women business owners in the community. Why not a partnership? Why not a collaboration? Many times part of our issues are we are too busy reinventing the wheel with something that already exists. That happens even to our small business owners. You know, they don't check the market, they don't do this. Let's learn how to work together. Let's learn how to do things together. Let's learn how to serve our community together. So Monique and I were supposed to be coming together after our last event. I think we met each other on a call with you. We're gonna do that this time. Um, and uh, there are too many people that have a need for having help in this area, especially our minority business owners who were not able or prepared to take advantage of PPP, idle or any of these things because of the lack of infrastructure, because of the lack of training. That's what my organization does. That's what I have a heart and a passion to do. We need to come together so that we can help and bring services to the people that really need it. So that's what we need to do. And yeah. I, think, I think the college could be a catalyst in, in that. And just showing the strength of coming together is, is something that's powerful to meet the need of the entrepreneurship community in the Charleston area. I would exactly. also add to that. Uh, sorry, Monique. Um, what I've noticed a lot about the CFC Business School, and I think um, Dr. Hansen's done a really good job at kind of pivoting from this, is 
it's turned towards a lot more of a sustainability theme and like a clean green earth theme. And I think it's kind of straying away from like social topics, which I don't really know why. I don't really think there's like a reason. I just think sustainability has been a little bit more popular. But I think, you know, what Dr. Hansen was saying is there's more classes being offered talking about, you know, things that we had conversations about tonight. And sure, these conversations are hard and, you know, they're emotional, they're tough to think about, but it's definitely something that um, I know the college is definitely getting better at because we've had more classes and, you know, I love signing up for these classes. I think they're amazing. And, you know, working with the college, I think there's definitely something that we could do as students, um, you know, whether that be working with Dr. Hansen as well, whether that be working with one of you guys. Um, but I think it's just very exciting um, to think about putting on more events and things like that. Yeah, I was just gonna add on Lucy to what you're listening to what you just added on. Um, you know, you would think in this whole sustainability that economics would be included in that because we are the first, I mean, one of the leaders in the state of South Carolina for, you know, promoting local first, local businesses, right? And um, the amount of tourist dollars that comes through. And so you think about the tourists that come here, you know, the businesses that are downtown. So again, I guess I'm saying without saying is that we have to also not only collaborate, but bring people to the table that can make the change. In the city of Charleston has not failed uh, minority businesses, but they are not doing anything to help promote and move this specific agenda forward. And it's going to be unfortunate to, again, I go back to the African American Museum to have such a highlight and a pillar in our community in downtown. And we have a lack of diversity surrounding it. So how are we going to ensure, and maybe these conversations are being um, had um, I'll find out after um, Dorothea and I have lunch and we uh, talk a little bit uh, more detail, but, um, you know, maybe these conversations are being had about the plan to ensure, you know, even if it's a, a incubator space of sorts that's downtown to allow businesses to get their clientele up, but to be able to, to benefit off of a, 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 a market foot traffic that in some cases may venture to Mount Pleasant or North Charleston or West Ashley, but not all the time because we want them to stay in that vicinity because that's where all the hotels are and that's where it's walkable. So um, I, I think um, in, in thinking about these collaborations, um, College of Charleston, city uh, government, uh, county government as well, there, there has to be some sort of think tank that can come together to be able to to, to uplift and continue to fund these big programs. I mean, the increasing hope is in North Charleston, but there could be several locations across Charleston. So let's have those conversations. I don't mind ever um, making noise. Um, <laughs> I do through, you know, some of the city uh, commissions that I sit on. But again, um, if, if we're talking in the same circles that we're always talking in, then it's gonna always be in that same circle. So College of Charleston, let's help, you know, amplify these conversations, continue to amplify yeah. these types of conversations. Well, I, one thing that, that came to mind uh, while you're talking was um, when I was talking with uh, Ms. Carr here earlier today and talking about how there used to be so many more black owned businesses in Charleston mm -hmm. um, and you know, her, her knowledge of them, uh, I could see putting together and particularly with your interest in art, uh, maybe putting together an installation that demonstrates in some way this, this collapse of black owned businesses in Charleston uh, as part of the story that may be part of 
the museum itself. But if not, then at least um, something that the college could certainly host, like maybe even um, working with the, the School of the Arts to have um, like a competitive uh, exhibit of uh, in that regard, like maybe a collaboration between the School of Business, School of Arts uh, to portray how uh, black owned businesses have, you know, risen and fallen over time throughout Charleston. If, if I may um, continue with your message there, David, um, ladies and Miss Lucy and the younger um, participants, I'm old school, so I will bring a lot of old school messages here, and especially being a native. Um, everything we're talking about now has already been or had already been developed here in Charleston. Um, so just what, what I want you to know, it wouldn't be anything new. Um, there's a building at the corner of Cannon and Cumming. It has Wilhelmina's across the name. My mother was one of the first people to utilize the Charleston Community Development Funds to rebuild, improve, and own that building. Now, it's in my family. Guess what? My family doesn't even want the community to know it's Black-owned because when it was... Um, uh, uh, Latasha's for a minute, the restaurant, then it went to five loaves. Um, it was more um, uh, supported by the, you know, white community and they want to leave it like that. So there are a lot of different historical dynamics. So my only point to you is what happened to let you know what happened after they had the Community Development Corporation and they funded certain uh, entities to allow them to grow such as my mother's business, then it, it just died down. So it's a continuum that, you know, with the new fresh blood and ideas that, you know, yourself, the College of Charleston, I feel can make more of a mandate that we can't establish this because Mr. Dorethea knows what I'm talking about. We can't just support her for a little while and then let it just fall by the wayside, you know, uh, a good example, I am a product of affirmative action, and I'm very proud to say I am. But guess what? It became an issue and they let the doors of opportunities that allowed me to be the first and the only um, just fall on the wayside with all the criticisms about it, as opposed to looking at the good things that it was set up to do. So, you know, bottom line, my advice to you younger people is to recognize that this isn't the first time that you're going to be asking, but it's also about who leads it and how you develop long-term strategy to make sure, sure that it just doesn't fall under the bus. Well, thank you for sharing that. Honestly, I really appreciate it. Um, and I know, even though you say it's old school, it's still important. Um, you know, uh, the four of us have meeting a meeting set up on Monday to kind of talk about, you know, everything that was discussed during this. And, um, you know, I really appreciate you guys kind of being really honest with us and telling us exactly kind of what you want to see in the future, just because what we were saying before about how you know, young adults have a really big impact on communities, especially being a college student. Um, you know, we can reach a lot of people through different channels. And that's something that, you know, I definitely want to use to my advantage and your advantage. So, you know, like I said before, please absolutely um, connect with us and stay in touch with us. And if you ever need anything, like, please let us know and, you know, we can definitely work with you. Um, these girls are absolutely fabulous. They're so sweet and so helpful. And, you know, the four of us can definitely help you guys out in any way, shape or form. Well, one thing um, everybody could do is uh, make sure to join the LinkedIn group 
uh, fast, um, was it? I forgot what it's called now. Supporting. <laughs> supporting, yes. Supporting women of color entrepreneurs in, in, in South Carolina. Because uh, the more people that are there, the more help there can be. Uh, so encourage people to join. I'm happy to make anybody that wants to take more active role in it, uh, a manager of it, um, and, you know, uh, make use of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a platform that we can use. It's free. Um, it started, there's 31 members, I think, something like that. Um, I can, you know, we can easily get that to, you know, 310 in no time, I think. And then, then it becomes valuable as a, as a place to, to network and get help in conjunction with everything else, but there, there's at least that. Yeah, that group is great. There's also a lot of um, people in there that host events and um, they're usually like right up everybody's alley, which is awesome and they're really interesting. So it's another, you know, way to get out there and spread your name and your business, which is super awesome. Um, but does anybody, before we wrap this up, does anybody have any final questions or anything else that they want to talk about? I don't have a question, Lucy, but I was wondering if we could share for the other groups event is, uh, I think, April 21st. Yeah, so we, theirs is going to be posted in that LinkedIn group as okay. well. Okay. So their Eventbrite, I think, and their flyers should be in that LinkedIn group. So if you guys wanted to join um, the other group's event as well, I know that one's going to be really interesting and those girls and Hayden. <laughs> yes. <laughs> in, into that um, event. I know they worked really hard on planning it and um, I know they're really excited about it. So definitely go check that um, LinkedIn group out because there's going to be another event going on, like you said, the 21st of April. And that's uh, going to be a workshop. Kind yes. Of, right. Financial um, literacy. Better. Yeah, and finance. Yep. All right, well, um, all of our emails and our names are in the chat, um, on the Zoom chat. So feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn and shoot us an email. I know I will definitely be following up with you guys and I'm really excited to, you know, collaborate and, you know, work towards making sure the college can definitely put their foot in the door and we can make things happen. So thank you guys all for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for thank coming. You. It's been so helpful. We really appreciate it. Thank you. all Thank you. And for um, having us. just to let you know that the, the students also have to write a, a, a report, you know, just a after event report on, with some suggestions and all. And um, I'm sure they would be happy to share it with you all afterwards. Absolutely, yes. Yep. Thank you, ladies. Well, thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, ladies. Good night. Good night. And, and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Hansen for all being a um, just a voice and a champion for moving this type of uh, programming um, forward and always embedding it in your your classes. It's, it's I've enjoyed every single event that you've all produced and just working uh, with both groups on these events. It's just I mean, it's clear to me that you set the tone and the passion and just continuing to keep the uh, flames going and passing it through through the students. So y'all have been great. Um, like I said, the events are great and we we very much appreciate them. So keep them coming. I need to say this to the ladies. Um, being old school, <laughs> I participated in the first civil rights movement and I'm documented in photo at 15 years old. So I know from once from whence I speak. And what attracted me to David was feeling, you know, as I kept looking at what you all were doing through his direction, 
I felt like he was one of those civil rights, you know, had that passion and that spirit and that commitment, you know, and, and there were a number of Caucasian men, and I have to give them their propers, that really were in support of in support of the civil rights movement way back when, when it wasn't the end thing to do. They helped with a lot of legal issues. They helped with a lot of, you know, just num you know, organizational issues and they even died for the cause. So we have to give Dr. Um, David his propers and let him know we truly appreciate it. We do. Yeah, we do too as students, you know, we wouldn't have the opportunity to even be on the Zoom call with y'all if it wasn't for the class that we're taking with Dr. Hansen. So it's a really great opportunity for us as well. Thank you. I, I like, uh, it's it's become a passion for me, yeah. Uh-oh, you're not about to cry, are you? <laughs> I know I, I'm crying. <laughs> this is so fabulous. I, I'm ready yeah. to share shed a tear or two. It's a safe space, so tears are <laughs> appropriate and and welcome in most cases. So uh, feel free, <laughs> hey, Monique. I got to know you personally. I want to. I want to cry. On, I'm ready to cry on somebody's shoulder. <laughs> All right, I got two of them. So just, come on, girl. <laughs> oh, girl. Okay. Well, thank you all. all. Right. Um, good night. I'll I'll make sure I connect personally with everybody too. So I'm looking forward to 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 meeting you all outside of the Zoom when yeah. we are able to, and you know, continuing um, our relationship. So good night and thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.